Welcome to the Entrepreneur Podcast, filled with marketing and leadership tips on launching and growing your business with your host, Deanne Mora. Today on the podcast, I have the pleasure of welcoming leadership and team development expert, Dr. Margie Olson. She has designed, delivered, and facilitated learning and development programs from academia to nonprofit organizations and corporate America working with such notable brands as Target, Cargill, and Lockheed Martin. She focuses on building top teams for lasting change to improve organizational performance. Margie, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much, Diane. Glad to be here. Glad to have you. Let's start with your story. How did you first become interested in organizational development? There were a couple of main points. Number one, our first leaders are the people that are around when we're born and our first teams are anybody that's in the household and then first job, school. And uh, our day-to-day automatic pilot draws from that experience. We learn how people lead by watching the adults that are taking care of us by being on those first teams. And so in my case, we moved a lot. I was the youngest of four. We moved 22 times by the time I turned 17 years old. A lot of chaos, a lot of uh, doing things the same over and over again and hoping it'll turn out differently. So I got a chance to have firsthand view of what that's like. And then I was in corporate America for decades and I'm not someone who's going to take apart the toaster or look under the hood of a car, but I wanted to understand how organizations work. What I saw around me was not understandable. I just didn't understand. And especially after four years of coursework, so I went back to college and got a doctorate. And in that four years of coursework in organization development, I knew that we know everything we need to know about being an effective leader, leading a high performing team. And that was 10 years ago. So now we're at 40 plus. So a lot of the theories and the models and the recommendations for how to learn to be a a leader and how to grow a high performing team, we've already known that. So then what is happening? And I, and so I set out my dissertation, my sub subtitle is what the heck, what is happening here? And so I wanted to understand, spent the next couple of years, finished my dissertation, and then have spent the next several years uh, as a consultant having clients to really hone in on how is it that the art and science of leadership and teams is not making its way into permanent change? And so I was able to use my own education, my own talents, my own passion and interests to identify a few key things so that leaders who don't think it's possible because it's not been on their radar. They've not been on a high-performing team themselves. They haven't had a high-performing leader necessarily. They may not even have realized it because they don't think that there's better or more that they can do. And once I put all that together, I developed Top Team Accelerator so that we can methodically and in sequence focus on behaviors, focus on what we know to help leaders lead the way they've been wanting to all along. Mm, that's great. You know, I I think when it comes to leadership, there's obviously a lot of fundamental principles, but, and look, I know we're all very tired of talking about COVID, but there's no denying that it created a massive shift in the workplace. We experienced the great resignation, uh, many people deciding this was the time to launch their own businesses and a general shift of more control to the employee. But now things seem to be shifting back, at least partially. We're seeing some corporations have rolled out return to work requirements while others have chosen to remain virtual or hybrid. So how do you characterize, you know, you're out there in in the wild, so to speak. How do you characterize the environment in which many of us are leading today and how much has truly changed since before the pandemic? So I would say that one of the things I learned in my research is that virtual teams, this was before the pandemic, virtual teams do as well as in-person teams, and it's because they go after it. They know that because they're global or they're virtual, that there are certain things they have to do to have better meetings, to be uh, effective. And so because they went after it, they had as much success as intact in-person teams, sometimes even more. So when a team and a leader go after certain aspects of being effective, you have a greater chance of being able to accomplish that. And then the, the, and there's been a lot of disruption over the last 20 years. There've been a lot of Think about 2001, think about 2008, and the tectonic plates just keep shifting. And what I find right now is companies who are identifying a strategy for why we need people to be in person 
and then communicating that openly are having a much better response to employees and potential employees for asking them to come back into work physically a couple of times a week or whatever is your choice. Some companies are demanding it and they're not giving explanations and there some people are acquiescing. And I got to say, I'd be concerned as a leader if the people that are um, working for me feel like they had to acquiesce. The talented, the truly talented people, they're out of here. They know that they have other options and we want all the people that we want to come. And so I would say the thing about something like Top Team Accelerator is when you have put the building blocks in place for trusting each other on that leadership team, collaborating with each other, being able to tell the story of each other's teams, knowing that all the teams are rowing in the same direction, which by the way, unless you may not realize it, but that's not happening. And that's one of the greatest challenges that's causing your pain, your problems over, the, over and over again, firefighting, gossiping, complaining, coming to leaders to solve their problems is because everybody's sort of off on their own. When you put the building blocks in place to be a cohesive, high-performing team, these issues, for example, returning to work, global supply chain, workforce, where are the workers right now? If that's a question you're asking yourself, you can't, right now. <laughs> yeah, you can't get the answer because, and you have this collective genius among your team and you're firefighting and the same people are doing all the talking and you actually maybe don't even have the right structure for your team to be a high performing leadership team. And so you're doing same old, same old. And instead of realizing that you're missing the chance to solve those issues, you think it's because there's nothing you can do. The market is the market. This is all out of my hands. Every organization is going through this. Well, guess what? The ones that are working through it and solving it are maximizing the creativity and the input of the people around them because they're set up to do that. Number one, because they fix their meetings. Number two, because they fix the structure of your leadership team. So if your leadership team has 20 people, that's not a leadership team. That's people on the team who are experiencing FOMO, their fear of missing out. So they're on the team because it feels good to them. Politics dictate that you have to have this person or these people on the team. What that means is you've got a smaller group of people leading, but it's not transparent. People probably know it, but you're, but, so once you fix your structure and then once you get clear among yourselves, you invest time and energy on yourselves first, put the oxygen mask on yourself first, and then you come back and cascade some of those learnings and uh, new and those building blocks and processes to your teams, pretty soon you really do have people rowing in the same direction. And you really do have some of the firefighting reduces because those issues are being solved and you're up and running on processes that can be automatic pilot, leaving time for you to truly spend hours on just supply chain, if that's one of your needs or pains, on just workforce, if that's one of your opportunities, or you have a new market that you can go into, you have a great opportunity, you can focus just on that. And after a few wins like that, you start to realize how focusing on behavior, talking about behavior out loud, doing those things that really matter to have be a high-performing team, you would never want to go back to the old ways. Hmm. There's a lot to unpack in what you you just said. I think it's really interesting. So when you say the teams that really go for it are the ones that regardless of whether they're in person or virtual, that they're the ones that tend to be successful regardless. Yes. So when you say go for it, what does that mean exactly? Is that putting so, the structure in place? So, yep. So one of the things that I learned along the way, and I have insisted on applying it to our approach, Top Team Accelerator, whenever I'm coaching, my team is coaching anyone, is we start with how the brain operates. So mm -hmm. everyone's out there and they're hiring for legal because they know those people went to law school and they know how to find answers to their local and you know questions, regulations. They hire for finance and accounting because they know those are experts and they don't want to get that wrong. And then they're all just sort of guessing on the behaviors. And the truth is our behaviors at work, we just learned at growing up, we learned in our early work years and the brain, 99.9% .9 of it is autopilot because it's reserving all these resources for risk and opportunity. 
any threats that might come in. It's just, so every day I'm operating on autopilot on everything that I do. And when we want to make a change, we have to go after it. We have to intentionally engage the brain in ways that pull it in to be a partner. And so when people are intentional about their leadership and intentional about their teams, they, first of all, so I, we teach them the knowledge and the information that everybody has had access to for um, decades. And it's the art and science of how to lead and the art and science of how to be a high-performing team. And their brains are dealt with in a way that engages them in a way that works. And so one thing is the leadership is missing the how. And so you're, you're expected to know the how, but you don't know the how. You might be a scientist or you are a, a, a leader that has led several organizations and now you've been, uh, you're in this organization because you've led successful organizations. Or you might be someone who moved up in the ranks as a people leader and you now the leader. That doesn't mean that you really know how leadership is supposed to go. What can I do to lead? So then we give you the knowledge, but then we understand that it's all about your habits. So James Clear, Atomic Habits, uh, you don't that. rise, you don't rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your habits. And so when we hear culture, the things going on around you eat strategy for breakfast, I would say our habits are eating our strategy, our goals, our desires, the things we want to have different. Our habits are what is keeping us the same and our habits are what can change. Now, changing habits is difficult, but not if you do it piecemeal. So the teams that go after it are taking, learning the knowledge because they wouldn't necessarily have, and then they are applying it, and then they're taking the wins as they have them, and they're starting to pull the levers to develop new habits, and then where they are still struggling, depending upon your industry, depending upon your own culture, depending upon the, the type of team and the work that you do, you're going to have time and energy now to drill down into stubborn challenges because you've worked some of them out. And pretty soon, you start to see oh, we've developed habits for high-performing meetings. Oh, we've developed habits for talking to each other instead of gossiping. I shouldn't be going and gossiping to my team about my leadership team. I should be going to them. We should be a well-oiled machine. And then we should turn around and speak with one voice to our own teams. Once you start developing being those habits, you have freed up energy and time to go deeper on the issues that truly need extra attention, including opportunities. Mm. You know, one of the things that you mentioned is about the leader not knowing the how, which I think is absolutely the, the case, with the exception of probably, you know, when someone is launching their business and they launch it as being the doer, and then ultimately mm -hmm. they rise through the, the ranks, have other people doing for them and maybe have a hard time letting go. <laughs> but but it it's raises the question of, as you're building a team, looking for experience versus cultural fit and training. And that's, I think, something that a lot of leaders grapple with is the, you know, should I hire the expert and try to mold them into the team, sort of train them into the culture, mm -hmm. or do I hire somebody who I think is a good cultural fit and then train them on the expertise? What's what's mm -hmm. your take on when you would go one way versus the other? Absolutely the second one. And there's usually a third option. But what I would say is one of the things that we do in this program is build a workforce strategy that includes all the things we know now that work really, really well. I would say that most workforce strategies and onboarding are completely deficient. They're just not getting you what you need. If your person is new and they're spending the first several days all by themselves, already you have lost all that time to get to know them and for them to get to know you. So later when you don't like how they're leading their own teams, or they seem to be uh, exhibiting characteristics from the places they've been before, or they just don't get that you're an honest, open team holding each other accountable and they're not good at that. It's because you are expecting them to sort of figure that out or you're so busy firefighting, you're so exhausted, you're so burnt out, you're so not- Give me a warm body and yes, have yes. them help me. And, <laughs> right? and, I yeah. hired, <laughs> and I hired you to have everything, so bring it all. No, bring your knowledge, bring your skills, bring your experience. I, as a leader and the leadership team, we do this together. We're gonna bring you into all the things we had to learn when we became a high-performing team. Who are we really? 
And what are we going after? And what is the leader's priorities and goals? Because what happens is some, so you got a leadership team and they each go back to their own teams. And some of them truly don't realize that they're not working on the goals that the leader is has as a priority right now. And they think I meet with that person every day. How can I possibly not know? Well, I'm. The, you might not. It's actually pretty common for even small groups to not be telling the same story and not even realize it. So, so we all that process that we all come together and really truly learn what we're supposed to be working on today and how we know how we're doing and we've fixed our meetings and we are um, able to be nimble and not have to firefight so much. So now we have more time and energy for the things that we can focus on, stubborn challenges or opportunities. The new person comes in and learns all of that as well. And you, and then at six, eight, 12 weeks, you'll, you might find out actually not what I thought, or they might find out, you know what, this is not what I thought. And that's fantastic because it costs a lot less to figure that out in those early weeks or months than to have someone be the weak link. And you just really don't even, you're just not even really sure what to do about it. And pretty soon a year, two years, three years goes by. And you're kind of counting on the team to make up for that link when what you really want is everyone to feel like they're as engaged and as um, aware of what you're doing. It feels so good to be a part of a well-oiled machine. Oh, absolutely. So onboarding Nirvana, you're a CEO. I'm someone who maybe has, I don't know, maybe four or five years of experience. I'm pretty junior. You've just hired me. What what should my first week look like with you? Mm -hmm. And I would say either that or I just promoted you. So you've even been internal, okay. but let us not assume that someone internal gets what we're doing. And so the first week, actually, so what I recommend to clients is six weeks of an onboarding program. And it's not a list that you check off. It is the first the first week, we, this person is never alone. They're never, ever alone. And there is a, there is a benefit to in-person. And that is what companies are struggling with. And they're just going to grapple with for a while. We know data-wise that there are, there's some energetic exchange. There are some positives. There are some unconscious things that happen for uh, people that are in person that they just don't happen um, um, when you're virtual. And so you find that right balance so that you can get to the point where you feel like you have the structure that is really working and find the balance of in-person and remote. And that person needs to be in-person with you and your colleagues to the level that it brings them in. And they may be off on their own doing some reading, but for the most part, they are with you in conversations. They are observing when you're having other conversations. They are, they're getting a chance to ask questions and you're getting a chance to give them information. You're doing assessments. Uh, I love the working genius assessment. So you're going to do that. We have a team assessment. So they're going to do that. So all of the assessments that we have done to be a high performing team, they're going to do those and everybody is going to move along together. They're not going to be dropped in six weeks later and expect to catch up. They're going to drop in at the first point and they're going to be catching up and brought along with each of you along the way. And what's really cool is that they can start to add value almost right away. When they feel like they're supported and they're a part of a group and they're not off there on their own and they're not thought of as it's a negative being new when they already feel a part of the group and everybody is kind of mixing it up at the same time they hit the ground running and you but again you're you you are honest with them that we're both checking each other out and we're going to give this a little time and then we're going to help you on your way if this is not what you want or this is not what we want and that saves you can just save a gazillion dollars by having an approach where everybody feels like they like how it is that you're bringing on people and uh, moving them through. Yeah, it's it's fair. It's like, I love Brene Brown and she has a, a quote that I really enjoy and it's clear as kind. Yes. Uh, and I yes. think, I think that's beautiful because there's, you see, you know, like, like you, I spent decades in corporate America before having my own business and just finding that there's so many people who were sort of bounced from one group to another and they were never really a fit and they were never really a performer and no one had the kindness to have that sincere mm -hmm. conversation with them. Mm -hmm. So one other thing that I think is really interesting in today's workplace is that for the first time in history, we have five distinct generations working we do. in the workplace. We have, I mean, granted the, the traditionalists are getting up there and they're probably holding you know, board seats and, or maybe they're leading family-owned 
corporations, but they're still around. And so we've got, we go from them to people who were, were, so they were what kids before color TV. And now you've got the Gen Z's who were practically born texting on a cell phone. So what are your thoughts on how leaders can navigate this diverse workforce? Mm -hmm. So what I love about intentionally becoming a leader that's high-performing and leading a high-performing leadership team is all of these, you know, dozens of issues that might come across your desk each day, you actually have time and energy to approach them. And when you have, when you cascade out into the organization, whether it's small, medium, or large, this kind of healthy, clear communication and engagement and accountability when accountability is not a negative or a reprimand, it's actually natural. People feel good when they can hold each other accountable and have themselves be held accountable. You start to be able to be much more open, much more strategic, much more practical about the small, medium, and large issues that we face today. So five generations, where it's problematic is when they're not clear, where it's problematic is when they're not talking about it. Oh, it's an HR issue. We can't talk about it. We absolutely can talk about it. We don't have to talk about somebody's age, but we can talk about somebody's experience. And some of that knowledge transcends generations and our gifts, our unconscious gifts transcend generations. Yep. I can be born a native into the, the digital world. And I have knowledge that might be the kind of energy and the kind of unconscious ways of knowing that someone 40 years above me can be. We need everyone. So there was a time when we were saying, come on, boomers, we're, it's time for you to, now we're saying, everybody, can you please stay? We need you, but, but it's not enough to just have them. I would say that things like diversity and inclusion, some uh, organizations are finally waking up to how to truly make the most of a diverse workforce. And when you don't do that, you're missing out on everything. When you have a glass ceiling for all different kinds of groups, you are missing out on all of their genius, the collective creativity, the knowledge, the experience, and it's the world and you're missing it. When you have time and availability and a mental energy to think about and talk openly about these questions, you have a much greater chance to try some things and you can fail faster. You can explore, you can, somebody can try this and somebody can try that. And when people feel like they are clear is all is what is needed for all kinds of success. When people feel like they are clear and they do feel like they trust that it's okay to have these issues and to talk about them openly in ways that are strategic and forward looking, they will be a part of the conversation and you will find out from them all these different groups, things, uh, possible opportunities and strategies you never would have heard about or thought about because you've had the same people in power over and over. So it gives you a chance to just maximize the creativity and the genius of everyone in your organization. And that's what you're learning for and looking for. And that's not new. We've always had that opportunity. We've always had that need. Some people say, oh, you know, things are different now. Actually, no, they're not. We've always missed out on the benefit of diverse groups and all different kinds of, of, of backgrounds of people that you are a much, you have much better numbers, much better organization when you're making the most of all of that. No, I agree that all of the, all of the data supports that diverse, truly diverse teams just bring those different perspectives and, and the performance is higher. Yes. Uh, and it's, you know, the challenges that we're, I think leaders may be more comfortable with people who are like themselves. Correct. They feel like they relate more to people who yeah. are like themselves. And so now trying to understand the unique needs perhaps of, of people from different backgrounds, mm -hmm. it's, I mean, it's a challenge. So what are, you know, how do some leaders who maybe are not experienced yet with leading a diverse team how do they open themselves up to that? Mm -hmm. So what, first of all, when we put in place the kind of coaching and the structure and the building blocks for uh, high performance, any leader who's never even had a class about leadership will learn all that they need to know to do that first step, that first year of high performance. And when you talk about leaders, you know, kind of thinking about the people that, that are familiar to them, that's why it's so important to have all different kinds of leaders. Because, and what happens is if I'm a person of a certain generation, 
and my leader is of a different generation, I could be forgiven to come in with some stereotypes or some rolling eyes or some kind of disheartening feelings about this person who has a different uh, lifestyle right now than I do or a different demographic. Once we are all focused on the future and we are clear together and we are on, the, we know what the goals are, it inspires us and it pulls us in together and it, it, it we become a part of a team. When I was in the military, they we used to say I was in the army, we were all green. You come to the point where you retain your individual genius and creativity and um, unconscious gifts that you bring and you pull together and roll forward together. And that starts to feel really, really good. And after a while, this is why it's such a passion for me because companies still do not realize they're missing their greatest strategic advantage, which is getting everybody to row in the same direction. Talk about behaviors opening, get these behaviors and the performance to improve. Once you do that, you're actually making the world a better place. When you have a much more diverse among company after company after company, and every person in that that company represents four or five people out in the world, whether it's people that live with them or in their community or the food truck or the mom and pa, you know, store in their neighborhood or somebody that buys from them or that they buy from all, anything you do as a leader to make the world a better place, it is in your organization, it uh, benefits everyone. And so we want to look 10 years from now and see quite a highly diverse group of CEOs and boards and senior leadership teams and senior leaders. And when you do that, you naturally bring people along. Sally Ride that said, you can't be what you can't see. You can be, I would change that. You can be what you can see. We need people all over the company to see leaders that that remind them of themselves and working together and not looking, oh, we all have to be one certain age or we all have to be one certain background. We, When we all follow these principles, we all move forward together. And it really does change the company. I, I agree wholeheartedly. I think that's such a great point that, you know, by by improving the diversity of our teams, we're not just helping the person on the team. We're actually building an entire community because people need people need mentors. They need someone that they can look up to and say, yes, that person did it. You know, I can relate to them and be more accepting of those diverse leaders being themselves and not having to change their behaviors to be like us as well. And some of this is very conscious. It's not even unconscious. Someone in a company right now can say out loud, my company values who I am or not. They just know you can't fool them. They just know it's, it's in, it's in the, it's the fish in the water. It's the culture. They just, it's around them and they know they may not be able to say it out loud. You may fight them. Leaders will actually debate that. Oh no, we have a great, no, if pe people know, people yeah. know if it's okay to be who they are and to come through the ranks in the way to help in the way that they can. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned earlier accountability and accountability is something that I hear many leaders complain about. They mm -hmm. express concerns about their team not being sufficiently accountable yes. for their areas of responsibility. What's your perspective on accountability and how do you create it? Mm -hmm. So first of all, they are not be able to, able to hold others accountable because number one, they may, maybe don't even know how to do that. But also number two, they're not set up in a structure to do that. It is not fair to hold someone accountable who has no clear idea of what their role is, who has no clear idea of how their role fits in what we're supposed to be doing, who has does not have the tools or the processes in place so that they can be successful and does not know what their leader thinks of how they're doing ongoing. We build performance management on a quarterly or an annual basis and it's all rear view mirror. No, what we need is, and that's what this onboarding does this first six weeks is it teaches everyone to be constantly in communication about, oh, when you did that, that worked really well, please keep doing that. Or, oh, I didn't know you could do that. Great. Let's do more of that. Or, you know what you said that you were going to do this and we're at the next meeting and you, ha you hadn't followed through, tell me what's going on and what do you need? It's a lot easier to hold someone accountable when you have given them what they need to be able to be successful. And then the other piece is accountability is a, a natural desire. So if we are hardwired to grow, to succeed and grow, which we are, you're just not going to, you know, you're not going to survive on the savanna if you're just willing to hang her out and just wait and see what happens. We are hardwired to succeed and to grow. Nobody gets out of bed in the morning and says, today, I want to be really low subpar on my behavior. Yep. <laughs> Please let me, let me just see if I could be mediocre. Nobody even wants to be mediocre. And so, so 
it's really nice if you can. So that's why we start with really knowing each other and then building trust. We don't go after trust. You don't, you don't build trust in a class or in a meeting or in an offsite. You develop all those building blocks that naturally lead to people trusting each other. And once there are systems and structures in place and there is clarity and alignment about who people are and what they're supposed to be do, working on, and this team and that team should not be working on the same thing. And by the way, they didn't even know. Some of the smartest leaders, some of the smartest, most successful leadership teams in terms of the, the public awareness don't have this problem all the time. They, they're, they're saying, wait, I didn't know you were working on that. Once you have those pieces in place and you start to develop habits for how to talk about things, you start to naturally, first of all, be able to hold yourself accountable without feeling bad. So now you know, you, you're clear about what you're supposed to be doing and when. And so you can hold yourself accountable because it's it's more concrete. And leaders can hold leaders accountable because they now have a structure to be able to do so. They it, it, For everybody to be out and say, oh, I'm too busy. No, 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 you should be working on this. And then what happens is the natural, and we work on it if it doesn't bubble up naturally, is people start to naturally hold each other accountable and not in reprimands or not in calling them out in ways that that defy trust or, or ruin trust, but in ways that they're just talking about the work. They're not talking about my insides. They're not talking about who I am as a person. They're talking about my work and we all want to succeed. Oh, I can laugh about that. Or I can say, hey, I, that's not what I was thinking. I thought you were working on that and you could start to have awkward, challenging con uh, conversations that are healthy and that feel good. And when you are getting diverse opinions and, and views that aren't the same as what you would have inside your head, you will have conflict. You will have awkward moments, but you'll learn how to do that. And you'll notice in the rear view mirror, we're starting to hold each other accountable. And it happens naturally. Now you can go after it. If you're going to launch a new market or you're going to work on something that's really, really difficult, you can talk about how people will be held accountable. But the first thing is it starts to change the habits from before so that you actually have a habit of accountability. Mm. Yeah. So it sounds like you're building accountability into the, the culture and making it okay to, I guess, call people out when, if they promise something for a certain date and they didn't have it, that it should be acceptable within the organization to say, hey, what happened? Mm -hmm. And leaders model it. So the first person, so this program, one of the benefits is the leaders all, is always ahead of the leadership team in all of this development. And so, you know, Brene Brown talks about vulnerability, which might sound like a word that we don't want to talk about at work, but actually it's really just saying you're being open and honest and you need to be open and honest and be okay with not knowing things and okay with revealing something that is unpleasant. Otherwise you're not clear and you're not creating clarity among your people. You're not winning the way you want to. You may think you are, you could do so much more. So once a leader starts to get practical, practice at having habits about being the first one to admit something or ask for something that they don't know if they're going to get or not be the expert on something that starts to show up in the others around. They're giving permission for everyone to kind of turn the tide and start to be just much more open and clear and brave together. Mm, that makes sense. When you were talking about accountability, you mentioned about, you know, not waiting until the, the performance review to have the conversation about whether someone else has been accountable. But so let's talk about performance reviews. What are your thoughts? Should should we have them? Should we just give feedback on a regular basis? Both? How formal should they be? Mm -hmm. So one of the benefits or one of the challenges for organizations is they're all set up for systems. They paid a lot of money for, they did a lot of training. They got it working on autopilot and they don't have time. Their their HR is pretty stressed right now. It's been a difficult era for them. And everybody wants to do new things or wants to get better they don't want to revisit what they already have. That's what's so hard about these locations, these buildings. We paid for these buildings. We need people to come here so we can feel good about that. Right. And so performance management, the first performance management, whether your system requires, you know, paperwork and stuff inside is it's all about the leader. So if I'm a supervisor right now, or a man, mid-level manager, or a VP, or an executive, or a CEO, the first thing I would do is build performance management just among my team, which looks like trust, collaboration, support, accountability, clarity and alignment so that we can be accountable. And I would start there. And uh, what I recommend to teams is that they talk about how do we want to do that then? Do we use meetings for that? Do we have a document? Do we have a place where we put the information in and everybody can see it, some sort of a shared view? And then like the other processes in your business, 
you will make decisions about the systems. So there's a lot of processes in your business right now. And I don't come in and say, you need to set up these processes. That is not my um, lane. That is not my lane. You'll hire someone for that, or you'll pick up a, you know, one of the, the prevailing uh, models. You have to have processes that everyone is aware of, knows what their role is, knows how it fits, knows what the metrics are. And that's the same with performance management. I will say that companies emphasize it way too much and they de-emphasize the most important thing, which is, and so if I'm a leader, I want to know, are my managers and my supervisors, are they having conversations every week? One metric that we would adopt is, do you, manager, supervisor, do you talk to your people every single week about what's working and what is needed and how are they doing? Do they know what you think about what they're doing? And I, what I've seen is you can naturally shift the whole system when you start doing it at that level. That's one of the beauties. That's one of the processes that you can absolutely change in your little world. And all of a sudden things can ripple and change around you. Some you have to start at the top and you have to do whole system change. But that's one of the ones that you can let it organically shift to. And maybe it'll take a while because these systems are expensive and processes are well, remember habits, but you can do with, with or without that, you can absolutely do new processes that cost no extra dollars. They take almost no extra time. What they take is conversations that might not feel familiar. So, but I promise you, do that a few times and it shifts. It feels better to have those conversations rather than sit back and wondering, oh, are they gonna come to me again with this not having it being done? And I'm gonna blame them. I worked with a client once who uh, somebody was on a performance improvement plan and they were just lining up the documentation. And after a few weeks of implementing better meetings and implementing tools and processes so that each person had the same view of the information, that person became a star. Well, they were a star, but people didn't know it. And they almost lost that person. And so it is really important for everyone to have a shared view about how everyone is going doing. And I would start there. That's interesting. So you said meetings, meetings, you know, we love them, we hate them. What defines a good meeting? When should we have them versus just text mm -hmm. one another? So a meeting is an example of something. If it's not going well for you, and for most people, it's not Forbes calls it an $85 billion problem in the U S if your meetings are not going well, the meetings aren't the problem. It means that you have other challenges as well. That means that you're not talking openly about behavior, you're not changing habits, you're not trying some things and there's and having them stick. Everyone tries some things around their meetings and then they fall back to old behaviors or old habits or firefighting or the problems that they were having around meetings don't get solved. And so they just say, ah, meetings are terrible. Nobody likes them. We're fine. There's nothing we can do. The first thing you do is you pull out tactics from strategy. And so many times, and then you talk about behavior. So really this whole approach that we do with Top Team Accelerator, you can't do it. It's all about behaviors. And any other consultant or any other program or training that you try, if you're not talking about behaviors in the big way and then in the little way, then you're actually missing it. You're pretending that you can put your organizational dynamics on paper. You're pretending that you can write a few processes and then it'll go on autopilot. It won't. Your behaviors are every single moment of every single day. So the first thing you have to do is address people behaviors. Everyone has that one or two people that do all the talking. That doesn't mean you're getting anything done. And why are they at that meeting, by the way? And then you have tactical versus strategy. So if you're trying to do the day-to-day, -day, which is really important so we can reduce these fires, and someone brings up a strategy, someone should say, oh, remember we learned, we let's table that and we'll put that in the, the next strategy meeting. And then when you get to your strategic time where you've dedicated time just for that, and someone brings up a tactic, instead of saying, we really need to table that, what happens is, oh, we got to put out this fire. And oh, you're right, that is really important because of the bottom line, salespeople aren't going to get paid. There's all these reasons. And pretty soon you've muddied the waters and you're back to strategy and tactics are all together. And that's one of the easiest things to solve and one of the th biggest problems that you have. And so then, and then meetings, you need to every single time at the beginning say, okay, well, here's what we said we we're going to get done today. 
Here's how long it's going to take. And here's who needs to be here. And this might be the other greatest challenge is you have to actually have to be honest about, I'm not needed at this meeting. Or by the way, awkwardly, you're not needed at this meeting. And you want to develop, <laughs> yep, you want to develop that. And it can be easier when you do it in advance. When you get, when everybody, we laugh about it, we talk about it, it's going to be awkward, it's going to be changed, but let's do it in advance. Let's be really clear in the invite. We're talking about these three things and we need to get a decision. So we need these X amount of people here. We, we don't need anybody else. And then let people process. I'm supposed to be there. And that takes a while. Once you then at the beginning of the meeting, talk about, what it is that you said you were going to get done and you have the right people there, you make sure you end five, seven minutes before the end time and you share out loud what we decided, what decisions, what questions remain and what follow up anyone volunteered for or was voluntold. Oh. You will find initially, even if it's only a 20 minute meeting. People have different views, but they leave and they don't realize. How can I have a different view than someone else? What's in my head is what's in everyone's head. I'm mm -hmm. thinking it. We're all thinking it. Once you start to clarify what we said, we decided you're all of a sudden going to realize, wait, what? You're going to need another meeting because everybody has to maybe run off to the next thing. But you just identified that actually whatever you're doing in the meeting is not capturing the, 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 what everyone is saying for it to be, to have a shared view. And so you can get much more effective about how you do a meeting by slowing down, by sharing your desktop and writing what we said we decided, or if you're in person, you're writing it up on a bulletin board, or if it's a hybrid, you're doing both. And you are, you're constantly going after clear constantly. Are we clear? Are we clear? Are we clear? It takes a while. So it takes a while to turn that ship a little bit, but pretty soon you're humming and you would never go back to the old ways. And it becomes natural to realize when do we need a meeting and when can I just pick up the phone or when can I just send a text or when can I just send an email or do something on Slack or on Teams or whatever is your way to chat? Because you start to see meetings as not the way we work all day. Just because we have certain types of roles doesn't mean meetings are the only way we get work done. Meetings are very important, but they really should be about moving the ball down the field, making decisions, having follow-up uh, accountability for actions and raising questions. And once you separate out your tactics from your strategy, you can spend two hours on a strategy and save yourself months, weeks and months of meetings that aren't gonna get you there. Pretty soon it becomes a little bit more logical and natural to say, when do we need a meeting and when can we just send an email or send a text. So decisions, questions, action items. That sounds like something that we could all put in place right away. <laughs> and separate your tactics from your strategy. Separate the tactics from the strategy. Yes. Yep. That makes and be, be bold and be disciplined. So one of the things you're doing is you're developing discipline without going after discipline. You're developing discipline because you start to learn how to do it and you start to, it starts to become familiar and you develop habits. And pretty soon you realize this is not hard. This is not, it sounds too simple, but it really, it, what happens is people are just so accustomed to not doing anything about the, the bad meetings that they're, they just resign. And I promise in every team, there are people that are really good at this and they've been waiting. They just didn't think it was possible or they didn't think anybody was going to come along with them. They don't have any power. They're not raising their hand they're going to be so happy and thrive and be the ones to bring everyone else along. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You've talked through our discussion today about your program, Top Team Accelerator. Could you share more details on yes. how it works? Yes. So there are four pillars and they are logical and in sequence, but you don't sign up for Top Team Accelerator, which is a one-year program. You can't buy this kind of learning and you can't I can't hand it to you. You can't bring me in and have me do stuff and then leave and things have changed. And you know that because you've already done that. You've done trainings, you've done, you've brought in consultants, you've had coaches, you, you leaders, they, they think they, they should be able to outsource this. This is not what I need to be using my day for. Somebody in HR can handle this, or I have a friend who's a really good coach. They'll take care of this while I'm doing more important things. And the truth is every leader secretly wants to be a better leader and is not necessarily sure how. So you, we start with three months and we just do, um, the first thing we do is fix your meetings and we do the working genius assessment and a team assessment and the DISC assessment. And we look at the structure of the leadership team and we do a fit analysis. Are you a fit for this program? Because the way it's designed is that the leader gets the knowledge and the practice 
first, and then they facilitate, bring their leadership teams along. And then eventually into the program, we bring all those other teams into the working genius assessment and to start that process throughout the broader organization. And as the leader is going along and doing this, and I'm there to observe and to coach and to have open conversations about what's working and what is um, something that they can shift, eventually it becomes a norm to just talk about things that aren't working and talk about things that are working. So those first few months, we will find out if the team structure is the right structure, or you're able to change it. And if the leader really does want to do this, if they think they're bringing me in to solve something for them, it's not going to work for them. They're not going to be able to make these changes. And so once we figure out that there's a fit, then they then we can do the next nine months. And there are four pillars, teamwork, which we would have already started. And that is developing that trust and that collaboration based on getting to know one another, one another's styles and learning how to the value of being able to speak for each other and being in connection with each one so that we're in sync individually and together. And they may not have had that before, or they thought they had it, but it's not necessarily the kind that leads to trust and collaboration. And so, and the leader is leading all this and the leader is learning along the way. And then we shift into commitment, which is the combination of clarity. So that being clear and the alignment. So we need to be clear. We need to be clear what the leader is leading, what the board said, or what the leader said, or where the organization is going, regardless of what we think about it. And so alignment is getting on board, but alignment happens when we say, yeah, but I have all these questions and I thought we were doing this. And what about this market? And I thought I came here to do that. Once people sort of work through all that and feel heard and know that there's a logic kind of like, I understand why you need me to come back to work for a couple of days a week. Once people know things, they can make decisions. And when the team has shared clarity and alignment, and by now you have fixed your meetings, then we look at your operations. And that's the accountability piece. Are your operations the operations of today? What are your processes and your systems that are in place? Remember, I don't bring that, but we look at how are you approaching processes and systems. You're not going to do that without being serious about that and organized. And I don't recommend, but we can talk through, talk it through, but you need to have a uh, role clarity and org alignment around what your organization looks like. And then it's all about metrics. So what happens is many teams have way too many metrics that they're watching, which means they're not watching any, or they're so detail oriented that they're watching 30 and they're missing the big picture. So together, this leadership team determines what is that short list, the short list that they can recite in the elevator, the short list that they can remember when they're offsite doing something else and their metrics include behaviors. So gossip, complaining, going off and doing, leading your own team. We have, we talk about how that's going when you're in the process of changing it. And pretty soon we've kind of normalized behaviors come from our habits and they come from our autopilot. I'm not my behaviors. I'm responsible for them, but I, but I didn't necessarily want to do it that way. It sort of came out of my mouth or it was a habit that I did. And now I'm looking at it and I'm trying. So we normalize it. And then we do a lot of practice. So then the leader and the leadership team are learning to do all of these things. And now they're applying them and they've been applying them all along. We don't do case studies. We don't go into classrooms and do theory. We're always doing all the real work. So by now they're starting to get practice and they're starting to see what's working and what needs a, maybe some root cause exploration. And then I just do a lot of observation and coaching. We learn to be down on the dance floor for most of it. We're doing, 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 leading, leading, leading. Then we go up to the balcony and we observe ourselves. We learn how to just observe ourselves, laugh at ourselves, think of our team as a this sort of disengaged entity that is running this company. And so can we be, can we be casual and neutral about what's working well and what is still not working? Or can we be really serious about something that's not going well and our success depends on us talking about it and changing it? Then we go back down, the, down to the dance floor and lead. And pretty soon I can just sort of fade into the background and everybody has developed skills and capabilities and desires and habits that will live on in the future, which is the piece they've been missing. Mm, interesting. It sounds like a really thorough program and I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation today and let our audience know where people can reach you if they want to connect. Yes. So Olson has an extra E. So I'm at my uh, website is olson-consulting.com, O-L-E-S-O-N-consulting.com. And there you can find all kinds of resources to fix your meetings today, to videos and information and articles. And then I'm on LinkedIn, Margie, M-A-R-G-I-E dot O-L-E-S-O-N. Um, uh, follow me. On, I post a lot of content that's free. You can just take advantage of what is there. That's great. Thank you so much, Margie. I really enjoyed our conversation and I'm Thanks, sure Diane. a lot of value. Have a great day. 
You too. Bye. Bye.